nice global warming fall day. So, uh, we'll take advantage of that. Uh, this analytic combinatorics in several variables is uh, kind of a new little cluster of uh, research. And there's a web page here at acsvproject.org that you can look at at some time. Um, so, let me just say a little bit about what it is before going into the outline. Um, so, analytic combinatorics, so, so combinatorialists use generating functions to, uh, to enumerate, basically, to enumerate things. And um, analytic combinatorics is a branch of combinatorics dealing with using complex analytic methods and, and other analytic methods to try to figure out, once you have a generating function, what to do with it if you want estimates on sizes of, of the things it, it, it counts. And analytic combinatorics in several variables is trying to do that when you have a several variable generating function. In other words, you don't have just a sequence of interesting numbers. You have uh, an array of deep dimensions of interesting numbers. And then the analysis turns out to be a lot more complicated and interesting. So the outline for the talk, um, so I'm more or less assuming that I have an audience of general mathematicians, maybe none of whom is in my field. And this work is in my old field anyway. Like I do probability theory, but this is some other analytic gadgetry that's, that's not probability theory. So. Um, so it's, try, it's, it's really a broad strokes talk. It's to try to give um, a picture or, or a bunch of pictures about what this endeavor is, is doing, what, it, um, what its aims are, what its scope is, and then how the methods work when you look inside the black box. So it begins with the combinatorics and probability motivation for all of this. So in some sense, the introduction is almost disjoint for the rest of the talk. It's where do the problems come from? What sequences and arrays of numbers are we deeming to be combinatorially interesting? And the main point for spending some time on that is to show you, in case any of these things come from fields you're interested in, um, to show you what things theory of generating functions, and then in particular, multivariate generating functions can apply to, and what are the current you know, successes of ACSV, what are the problems in which if you use this machinery, you can say something either better or more, more easily than uh, you used to be able to say stuff. And then the other three parts there are to tell you how it all works. And so, um, so part two is, um, is the comp explanation of complex variable methods and combinatorics, and that might be old hat for some of you. Uh, part three says, oh, now we're in several dimensions. This thing that didn't look like it had any geometry to it actually does have geometry, and, and, uh, and the topology, in fact, is relevant. And so it explains that. The, um, and then the last part says, let's go back to the nitty gritty of hard to compute integrals and see what we can say about methods for computing those. And if you put together that piece with, with the other parts of parts two and three, then you get somewhere towards uh, like a, an automated machine for computing asymptotics of these, the numbers of these arrays once you understand their generating function. So, yeah, univariate generating functions. So this is the most common thing when people think of generating functions and they think of analytic combinatorics. So everything usually exists in, in one variable. Land. So you take a sequence of numbers, and in order to study it, so you might think of some famous sequence of numbers, like the numbers of partitions of the integer n. Varies. Um, so we want to study that. So uh, in particular, we want quantitative estimates. So you can think of two ways of studying these sequences. You might be interested in number theoretic properties, 
or you might be interested in how big is it. And so we're talking about asymptotic estimates, so how big is it. And so one of the techniques you can do is you can encode the sequence as a generating function. So you just make a power series with those coefficients. And uh, so the sequence always exists as a formal power series in the formal power series ring. Uh, but sometimes it might converge, at least in some interval. And then you also have an analytic object in our function. Um, and that will help you get estimates. In fact, if you have one that doesn't converge, often you just tweak it so that it converges. For example, a common thing to do is take um, a sub n z to the n, divide by n factorial, and sum those. So that's a good thing to do for two reasons. One, when the coefficients are growing faster than, um, than exponentially, so it doesn't converge anywhere, then uh, maybe, it's, maybe it does once you knock down the size by n factorial. So you could have an analytic object. And number two, the ways that these functions, these power series, combine, you, you do ring operations on the multiply, when you add them, you do composition. Um, when there are n factorials downstairs, those correspond to combinatorially relevant things. So the uh, generating function for the number of partitions of a set, not an integer, but a set. Um, there's naturally an n factorial downstairs. Convolution is kind of an interesting thing. My first year graduate combinatorics course will tell you how to interpret the convolution of, of these series once you put n factorials downstairs. So, how nice is this function? Um, if, if you just have some arbitrary sequence, even if it doesn't blow up on you, it's not that nice to function. Um, in fact, there are certain theorems about if there's integer coefficients, but there's not a kind of growth, and then you know, sometimes the unit circle is a natural boundary, and you can't extend the function beyond that in any, in, in analytically, in any uh, extended domain. Um, but sometimes you get really nice functions, right? Like rational functions, where even though there's a singularity, you can just go around it, and uh, you just have these little isolated singularities. Or sometimes there's a branch singularity. If there's, it turns out there's you know, fractional powers or logarithms. Um, and the recursive nature of the sequence then sort of translates into how nice is the function. And you can see here in the picture. So if you have actually a linear recursion, like the Fibonacci number, an plus 1 equals an plus an minus 1. So if you have 19 numbers, it's a rational generating function. Um, and then if you have a convolution identity, it's a Catalan numbers. So, so an plus 1 is, is like a convolution of okay, an and an minus 1, almost. Then you have an algebraic generating function. And if you have a polynomial recursion, so you have a recursion, but instead of constant coefficients, the coefficients are polynomials in n, then you have a differentially finite function. So it solves, uh, your, your function solves an ODE with uh, polynomial coefficients. And so all of these are pretty nice as far as analytic combinatorics goes. And in fact, rational functions are, are, are very nice, but they're trivial. So rational functions, the sequences of coefficients that they generate, uh, they all look like um, just either an exponential sequence or exponential times a, a polynomial or maybe sums of those. That's all you can get. So, not so interesting. Um, so, for example, just for fun, since I've maybe seen this, you have integer partition generating function. It's given by a little combinatorial analysis. You just get an insert product there and a uh, hundred and one years ago or so, there's this paper by Hardy and Ramija, which does uh, analysis of this in uh, relying on Cauchy's integral formula. This is the, the main workhorse for how all the analysis starts. You apply Cauchy's formula, and you get this integral formula for a sub n. And uh, you can actually you can then send that contour of integration. In this case, um, there's uh, it's analytic inside the unit disk, but then the zeros are really piling up on the boundary, uh, countably many zeros along the boundary. And so, um, so you, in this case, you blow up gamma and you approach the boundary as best you can. And they get some nice estimates, and, and then they get a leading term asymptotic out of it. It's very famous. Um, 
So, so that's a kind of a poster boy for what these analytic methods can do, and also for how old they are. So the last time I gave this talk it was 2018, and I gave a talk involving this kind of stuff. And so it was a 100 year anniversary of this paper. Um, anyway, uh, so this, the techniques, they kind of developed over a number of decades, from 1950 to 1990. So, I mean, I say 1950 to <coughs> 1918, but then not if people weren't doing a whole lot with this. It was, that was very driven by wanting to know this, this important you know, function, what it's like values were, that people kind of ignored the method for a while. 1956, Heyman showed that this sort of huge class of things um, where you can methodically apply the saddle point method to evaluate that Cauchy integral. Um, you just need some sort of regular behavior as you approach the boundary of the domain. And if it's, a, if it's an entire function, then as you approach it to And then in 1990, there's this lovely paper by uh, Philippe Flavelet and Andy Alisco uh, showing how, it, how to basically build a machine to transfer analytic knowledge about F directly to um, to asymptotic information. So once you, if you find the singularity of the function f that's closest to the origin, let's say the origin is over here somewhere, and this is the first singularity, and you make this sort of contour, uh, a keyhole contour around that singularity, looks like a Hankel contour, and you integrate, then it turns, uh, th th then you, you automatically get uh, great asymptotics over a, a wide class of functions. So this is any function which has a singularity, a single singularity nearest to the origin, where it's um, uh, the behavior there is uh, it's like class L log log log. So it's, it's you can have a product of a, any real power. Um, so that's why you have the branch point, and then times a logarithm. So you can get that branches again, then times a log log. So any combination of that, and basically. It, 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 it's a comparison theorem. So if, if you have nice functions that behave like that, like just one plus, let's say, say one minus x to the alpha, we know what the coefficients of that are. So then any sequence, um, I should have put the theorem on here, I didn't do that, but any sequence, uh, so, so if you have a generating function that is sort of asymptotically like that, one minus x to the alpha plus lower order terms near this, near this singularity, then you get a sequence of coefficients that's just like the one minus x to the alpha sequence only, plus a little order huh? perturbations with entire expansion. So it's a beautiful paper. Um, okay, so my topic is multivariate generating functions. So, uh, so we're going to just talk a little bit about where you find these. But for places that I have found these, you can count combinatorial classes. Sometimes you, you want to know. Um, how many trees there are of depth n with k leaves, or something like that. You have more than one parameter you're interested in, and you, you make a, an array of numbers a sub nk, counting that. Um, to compute recursively defined probabilities, um, I'll show you some, maybe one or two examples of that. Or to encode, encode. so I work in an area of probability that is sort of has these problems that are toy models from statistical mechanics. Um, so we have these ensembles. They are, for example, random tilings or, or easing models or something like that. They take place in a large box in, in a plane or, or Z3 or something like that. And um, then we want to encode features of those. And I'll show you examples of that. So, so these might not mean anything to you right now, but you'll see in, in short these examples. And then the areas in which there are applications so queuing theory, which is kind of its own little kingdom and deeper than you thought. I won't go into what it is if you haven't heard about it. Lattice point enumeration, it's combinatorics, although the lattice, lattice point enumeration has recently been used to do some really fancy things in SLEs. So, um, so it's, it's got some teeth to it. Um, analysis of search trees, so analysis of algorithms in general was where a lot of the one-dimensional combinatorics was developed. Uh, transfer matrices, lattice trans, quantum walks. I'll show you a picture of quantum walks. Um, idea that came up in early quantum computing. Um, sequence alignment and matching, special functions, random tilings. 
Um, so I won't show you pictures of all of those things. I only have a few pictures, but, but there are really a lot of areas of, uh, in which some problem, at least one problem, has been solved by multivariate uh, analytic combinatorics. So, um, so what's the scope? What generating functions can I hope to throw at this machine? Just like in the case of the flagellate list of transfer theorem, we need a singularity that has a type that's you know, sort of fairly narrowly defined, although it covers many, many generating functions. Um, so what kind of generating functions? So much of the literature, um, and I was involved in writing much of this literature, it concentrates on rational functions. So, um, and if you're keeping score, I told you that the univariate rational function theory was trivial. Like, you don't get a, a lot of phenomena in coefficient arrays. So part of what I'm going to show you in a, in a minute is how it's the opposite for multivariate functions, how the phenomena are very non-trivial. So instead of going into detail, which I don't have time to do, with it, like one application after another, I'm just going to show you pictures. And, and you have to see, like, take a minute to link up the picture with what the what generating function would be associated with that. And um, I'll show you pictures of phenomena, limit phenomena that, you know, Obviously, look complicated. What is AC, SD? Analytic combinatorics and several variables. Uh, uh, which I have to repeat enough that I use an acronym. Okay. 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 Um, so, so, but in terms of the mathematics, having rational functions uh, is not so restricted. So, if you have an algebraic multivariate generating function, let's say it's D variables. So you can always embed it as a generalized diagonal of a d plus 1 variable rational function. So maybe I should say what that means. So I have this array a sub um, r1 to rd, and I have a great generating function when I do the normal thing, I, I write summation a sub vector r, vector z to the vector r. This is monomial power notation. This is z1 to the r1, z2 to the r2, and so on. And uh, so I turn this, if I turn it into a generated function, it's algebraic. Then it turns out there exists a rational generating function um, whose coefficients um, Call it um, b sub r1 to rd plus 1, such that if I take b sub r1 up to rd and then repeat rd again, then I get a sub r1 to rd. And algebraic means it just satisfies the equation. Right. Algebraic means, um, let's call that f, and we have some polynomial of f equals 0 <coughs> polynomial. So, yeah, so algebraic generating functions are, so, so this, taking a diagonal, it's not really obvious at first what that operation that is at the level of generating functions. Like, you know, if I have a two variable generating function, um, and then only look at the diagonal coefficients and make a one variable generating function for that. It's not an obvious algebraic operation. Um, it's it's a uh, you know if you do like d module algebra, it's it's obvious what it is. But if you haven't thought about it that way, it's not. Um, and so this anyway, there's this theorem, and then um, not only that, but differentially finite functions. So if, if a differentially finite function isn't doesn't satisfy a property called globally bounded say what it is, then it can't be um, a diagonal of a rational function at all. Yeah. It would be OK to think of these as like an algebraic generating function is the slice of a rational function on a one dimension of the set. Yeah, you can think of it as a slice. And it's, uh, it's in fact, it's sort of very constrained. But you're allowed to say very, make a, a very specific demand on which slice. I see. Yeah. OK. So. Um, so anyway, definite functions, uh, if they are globally bounded, then they're at least eligible to be uh, diagonals of rational functions. And it's a, you know, 
you know, a 30-year-old fetcher that all of them are, but nobody knows. So if you want somebody to stand up and take notice, prove that conjecture or disprove it. Um, anyway, so definite functions um, really capture almost all the sorts of recursions in which the number of variables don't grow. So, um, so this is a lot of functions that you can understand. And, and when we do asymptotics, we take coefficient asymptotics. If we do, can do it for this rational function b, then we just sort of restrict to this slice, as you were saying, and then you get the coefficient asymptotics for a. So in terms of cranking out asymptotics, it's um, this, the, the class of rational generators is broad enough to capture a lot of stuff. And what does d finite mean? d is differentially finite. So I'll, I'll write it over here. So um, f is d finite if and only if there exist coefficients b and such that um, b and times d by dx. Well, let's see in the in the multivariate world. It's a I'm sorry, the one variable called I was going to write an ordinary differential equation um, for for the, uh, the polynomial coefficients. But really, in a multi-variable world, it's better to use this if um, the collection of partial by partial uh, m. So these are, when I put a vector here, so I mean you take some number of x1 derivatives, some number of x2 derivatives, some number of x3, the, the collection of those applied to f um, as m ranges over z plus to the d, right, that countable set of, of functions is um, actually finite dimensional vector space. So somehow, so, so in, multi, in several variables, this says not only there's a differential equation that's satisfied between f and its partials of some orders, but actually there is a lot of them. There's a whole holonomic demodulus. There's enough that you really are nailing down f. But the important thing is the constant coefficients. Um, let's see. Uh, so if this is true, then if you look at there are a lot of relations. Yeah. Constant coefficient. Okay. Yeah, I, I now I'm I'll get lost in thought, so I'm not gonna respond to that, but yeah. Um, I think this is linearly in the finite dimensional over maybe over the polynomial can go on. Over
because they're in L2 there, it adds up to one, and you get some cosine times some sort of deterministic function of your rescale location. So that's one kind of thing you can get. Um, this was one of the problems that started off the whole thing. It's a random domino tiling of an Aztec diamond with, I think, 47 um, side length. So in this case, if you let, this case I actually remember which thing it's a picture of. So if you take um, A sub, I'll, instead of calling my things R1 and R2 and R3, I'll call it N, I, J equals probability of finding a, um, a yellow tile. There are four types of tiles. It depends on when you, when you check your board cover it. It depends on whether the square is north, south, east, or west of the white square. And then probably playing yellow tile at position ij in the nth ensemble. So that thing will be a number between 0 and 1. And if I make a three variable generating function for that, I get a very simple looking rational function. There it is down there. And the behavior is, if I have to make it a little bit bigger for you to see it, but I want you to be able to see the bricks. But the behavior is that you get non-randomness off of the corners. It's just too easy to tile the, the right way and too hard to tile the wrong way. And then you get, in the middle you get randomness, but the randomness is slowly changing with your sort of macroscopic location. So it's a function of I over N and J over N. And the chance you see yellow, it's very small down here. It's very big over here. And there's a phase boundary between them which looks like some kind of nice simple close curve. This one is actually a sort of tangent to the diamond, but often it's not. There are these other random tilings. This one uses two different types of tiles, um, and it's, it's called the fortress tiling for reasons I don't really know, but um, here's a picture of the limit of a you know, you know, very large n. Probability is a color gradient picture. So you're seeing essentially the same kind of the generating function is basically the same uh, in terms of what it means. Um, here's a gradient plot, and then um, this is what's this? Oh yeah, this is a picture. So this is a rational generating function, which I didn't write down for you, but it has a denominator that is in three, four polynomial and three variables. And this is a picture of its zero set. Actually, this is a tangent coming to the zero set. The polynomial is kind of curvy globally kind of wraps around right near the interesting singularity looks like this and in projective space um, this would just be an algebraic curve and this is its algebraic dual which if you I, I drew it in this coordinate because it was easy to plot an angle but if you rotate it 45 degrees you get this thing so there's some relation between the algebraic geometry and the probability limit here. So just in there. That's the fun part. This relation exists. So not only the poles tell you if the information is zeros are interesting. So these are the zeros of the denominator. So they're, oh, they're poles. Sorry.
the amplitudes get spread out over a region which might grow like, you think it might grow like k to the one half, but it grows like, it's ballistic, it grows like k. And uh, so what you're seeing here is the, if I took n steps, this is actually an n by n region, and n was at 200, I think, and we actually computed the precise amplitudes of finding all these places using transfer matrix zero, and then made some sort of log intensity plot of the magnitude of the square, the amplitude, so that the actual probability you'll find it there if you look. Oh, but quantum walk, you're not allowed to look, except at the end. So if you, you can pick one time to look at it, and then to see that, and then there is no quantum walk anymore. Okay, kind of like the first yeah. cap. So, um, and here, just for fun, since I'm showing you pictures of the limit theorem and then pictures of the math that gave you the limit theorem, this is, all right, I couldn't draw this. It's a, it lives on a three torus in complex three space. I can't draw complex three space. But the generating function for you know, a similar thing, a sub nij generating function, um, it uh, is a rational function. The denominator is some sort of complex two surface living in uh, complex three space. And it happens to have high contact with the three torus. So counting dimensions, it should have uh, one, a one manifold or piecewise manifold in common with three torus, but actually has two dimensions in common with the three torus. And, um, and if you take that, and we, we uh, take the logarithmic Gauss now, so we sort of pretend it's real algebraic geometry for a minute and compute the Gaussian curvature everywhere, but in log coordinates, and then you, um, <coughs> Actually, don't, don't bother computing the curvature, just compute the, the gradient uh, logarithmic coordinates and then map that down uh, onto the directions. Uh, so think of the plane as a slice of protective space. Then you get, and if you just, this, this picture was produced by randomly producing points on this two torus um, and taking the log gradient direction, mapping it into here, and you get this nice picture that looks exactly like that because the density of dots is inversely proportional to the to go into the Gauss map. And there's a sub theorem that says that when you make when you finally make the formula for what's A N I J um, asymptotically, the formula has a little term in it, one over the square root of the magnitude of, of the absolute value of the determinant of the log Gauss map. Is the picture on the right in a, in a real three torus, or we're so, talking about a complex three torus? Yeah, the picture on the on the left is the amplitude. The picture on the right, you take the complex three torus, you take the intersection of the variety with that. It's a two. It's actually a two torus that lives in the three torus, or it might be a couple of disjoint two tori, and then it and then you take the log Gauss map. That turns out to map that to real uh, three space, which we think of projective two space. And this is, and it's actually this small region uh, because i and j are less than or equal to n. So it's a, it's a little diamond shaped region. I absolutely have to say less than n. Uh, diamond shaped region of projective two space, real projective two space. So all those I forgot to mention on this. It's obviously missing some information, but I'll say it, but that these are all, those, those intersections of the torus, those are all the vectors where the log gradient actually maps into real, the real subspace. Okay, and another quantum random walk that isn't, whose unitary matrix, it doesn't have the symmetries of the previous one. Um, and a double dimer configuration, I won't go into that, it looks, it's kind of like those other statistical mechanical models. I want to say some non-trivial mathematics and go through here. Okay, complex variable methods. Okay, so first of all, um, so so Q for forever after today, uh, Q is um, the denominator of my rational function, and this script V is the variety where Q vanishes. And if it's smooth, certain things are much easier. So that's part one of doing. So when we do, 
Uh, we write down the multivariate Cauchy integral, which in case you haven't seen it, it looks exactly like the univariate Cauchy integral, except these things are, you know, monomials, and this is the holomorphic volume form, and this is a little torus instead of a little circle. So, um, forget about most of this. I'm just going to talk about a simple pull on Q. So F equals P over Q, and here's a picture of maybe the variety V where Q vanishes, and then here's the torus we're integrating over. And just like in the one variable case, we're going to try to manipulate that torus into a better position to be able to do a saddle point integral. So we don't, you know, right now, it's very small, and the negative power of the z to the minus r thing is just huge because the z is so small and we have to expand it as much as we can. So we move the contour freely within the yellow region. As long as we don't cross the white stuff, we can move around the white stuff. It's not in the domain of analyticity. But the, the function is, is so it's holomorphic everywhere other than the variety. So we can, if you can go around the variety, fine. But if you can't, maybe try going through it and picking up a residue. So we're going to go through it, and the uh, arithmetic of dimensions in this two-variable case means that when we take this torus and pass it through this, we end up with a one object. So we end up with a union of curves. And then the Cauchy integral in this case reduces to the integral over the intersection cycle of the residue of this form. So that's just how residues work in more than one dimension. If you don't, if you haven't seen residues in more than one variable, don't think too hard about it. It's just uh, you get it, the original integral is the same as the integral of the residue form on the intersection cycle. And this happens works in any number of variables. Um, so then you need to, okay, what's a saddle point method? The saddle point method says, basically, when I'm integrating something really huge and getting something much smaller, there's cancellation. And if the cancellation is because the magnitude of the integrand is just much bigger than, than the, what you get after. And so if we, if we move the contour to shrink the magnitude of the integrand, and we do that as much as we can, and then and finally we're in this position where it's sort of minimized the max value of the of the max absolute value of the integrand. Then, then we're done. Hopefully we've gotten rid of this cancellation and we can actually just sort of add up the value and, and not worry about cancellation. And that's actually true because sort of calculus of variation says once you've moved into this position where you can't minimize, you can't, you can't decrease the magnitude of the integrand, then the, um, you're at a stationary phase point where as you're passing your contour, if you pass through this there's some uh, uh, critical value for the magnitude here, and it's and, and, and each way you wiggle, it's going to get worse. So you're at some kind of a saddle point, and I'll show you a picture of it in a minute. So we're going to take this function because z to the minus r. If I take the magnitude and then take the log, then I get this h function r with the dot product of minus r with the log magnitude of the coordinates. And so that's height. And I'm going to be pushing down to try to minimize the magnitude of the integrand. And so I've redrawn the variety V to be so that upwards means more value of H, and downwards means H is lower. And you'll notice there's some um, peaks because of the pole of this thing go up to infinity because the original variety probably intersected you know, one of the coordinates of zero at some point. So there's an infinite points. But, and then that torus corresponded to some, after you made a residue cycle, corresponded to circles, maybe a disjoint union of a couple different circles there. And now we have to push these down as far as we can. And can you see where they're going to go? It's kind of a trick question, right? So I'm pushing down as far as I can. And it looks like this circle kind of gets hung up here. And you can't make it go uniformly lower than this saddle point, and then this circle gets hung up there and here. And uh, so, so we're, we're trying to make a science out of this, pushing things down as far as they go. Let's see, am I giving away the answer yet? Or do we have to wait for that? 
Um, anyway, once you've done that and you have one of these circles sitting in kind of a saddle point position, if you go back to here and say what's that contour, it's we've taken this thing and we've pushed it so that it goes through a saddle. This is sort of standard contour uh, depiction of a saddle. And it's going through the saddle in one of the directions. This is going down both sides. So that's how you do the stationary phase method. And it looks awfully much like doing Morse theory. And in fact, you can, in a minute, harness some Morse theory to tell you what's going on a little bit. So we find the critical points. They solve a bunch of equations. We can do some computer algebra. And what happens in this smooth case is, in the end, we can then usually just read off what the asymptotic of uh, the interface is just a little contour draped over a saddle. It's kind of standard. You get expressions like this. It looks complicated, but it's really um, sort of something. So R and S are R1 and R2. So it's some sort of, this is basically Z to the minus R, just it parameterized a little differently. And then this is some homogeneous, I think it's minus 1 half homogeneous term, it's an algebraic term, and a constant out here. So you get these formulas for the coefficients. So let's talk a little more about that topology that we have in there. So there might be a lot of critical points. So we need to be sure that the contour really will do what we think. It will push down and hang itself up on a critical point and maybe repeat this further down. The rest of the contour could sort of be freely drifting down. You can stretch the rubber band, it goes down, but then you're going to hang up on another critical point eventually, and so forth. And so to which points can the contour be deformed? And once it gets into this position, what does the contour look like? And so these are the problems of Morse theory. And Morse theory says, you know, if my h func my height function is not proper Morse function, and we'll talk about stratify in a minute, then you can just use downward gradient flow, basically, and there's, it's not so obvious what to do in the stratified case when everything is not smooth, but we're in the smooth case right now. Um, so you use this gradient flow, and it pushes the cycle down into the position you want to get to. It doesn't really give you a good computational algorithm in the sense of some sort of arithmetic thing with curvature bases that tells you where you're going to end up. You have, to, you have to do some sort of computational homotopy stuff, but you, know, you could do it if you had to. So that's nice. Um, oh, I put this word, let, let h be a proper Morse function, um, plus some other technical garbage. So, so whether or not it's a Morse function can be finessed a little bit. But the fact that the Morse theory says it has to be proper actually causes a headache. And then I'll, I might say something about how to deal with that. So anyway, in general, you take the picture I drew, and you imagine that it's in any dimension, but you <coughs> Once you take the intersection cycle, it's d minus one dimensional, sitting in a two d minus two dimensional manifold v, and so it's a middle dimensional cycle. And the critical points of h all have middle dimension. I should have said index, with index missing. So they all have d minus one directions where h goes up, but d minus one directions where h goes down. So Morse theory says basically somehow the topology is looking like a bouquet of spheres or something, or a bouquet of, let's just talk about homology, so a bouquet of h d minus 1s. So these cycles, so this, this d minus first homology group of v just has, at every time you see a, uh, one of these saddle points, you get the generator. The downward manifold is a generator for the homology. And the question is, um, so and then you or at that point you can do the uh, integral over that downward cycle. So. The integral uh, looks like some formula. So let's sigma be uh, one of those saddle points. Then I can, given your description of the function and we solve those algebraic equations, I can compute a formula. So phi for formula, like the logicians use, right? Formula sub sigma of r is just this asymptotic expression that, that we know the integral over just that downward cycle is asymptotic to phi sigma. And then we resolve the original cycle t into the basis of these contours, gamma sub sigma, that hang from the saddle points. So some sum of integer coefficients, that's gamma sub sigma. And then 
like literally we just read off that there are asymptotic formulas if A sub R is asymptotic to the sum of N sub sigma times these asymptotic formulas. And if you want to be, so that's asymptotics in the weak sense. If you want asymptotics, like every single value is within a factor of one plus little of one times every single value, then you have to check that maybe for some R's you got some cancellation or something and look at next order terms. So what about when V is not smooth? So then, so, so I'm going to, where I'm going to end up is doing some funky kind of an, uh, harmonic analysis near not smooth points. But we can, here's a couple logical story near not smooth places. So then V is a stratified space. So the strata, wiki stratified space, the strata here, I have the union of three hyperplanes and the open, sets when I take one hyperplane minus the others, that's, those are strata, two-dimensional strata, nice manifolds. And then the one-dimensional strata, which are, look like lines, except they're missing a point at the origin, and they're still one manifold. And then there's a zero-dimensional strata right at the origin. So we have a stratified space, and then we do, without going into detail, stratified Morse theory tells you you can get uh, a basis only instead of looking like just a little d minus one patch hanging from each uh, smooth strata point. It gives you one of those within any strata. If you have just a one-dimensional strata, then you just get a little one-dimensional piece. But and if you, and if we're trying to compute d-dimensional topology, then where's the other d minus one dimensions? It's in. I'm going to make this go by very fast so I can continue. But you get you get this one-dimensional piece of k equals one, and then times some element of a d minus 1 minus k dimensional homology group that lives in the normal slice of a uh, variety at that point. But anyway, that's, we don't really need to skip through that. And then, unfortunately, so, so for two bad things now, right? One, the, you know, methods, I don't, we don't know of any method that nicely, effectively computes the decomposition the integer decomposition. Um, so that's kind of a research problem, progress. And then another thing which turns out to be, which looks worse but turns out not to be a problem, is that sometimes the Morse decomposition fails completely because, um, yeah, so what I said before, H is not a proper function. So here's, here's the picture on the left is the one I showed you, but the picture on the right is actually the right picture in dimensions three and higher, which is that, um, you get, your contours can get dragged out to infinity. So, so between two heights, that's not like everything's nice. The, the H is a, is a not proper function, the inverse image of a height of critical, a set of critical uh, things at a particular height goes out to infinity, which means you have to worry about what happens in infinity. And so then, to make a long story short, um, you solve this problem. So. You don't want your cycle to follow this path out to infinity. So you kind of look for a sufficient condition where it doesn't happen. And um, there are generating functions in which it does. So you need an actual condition that says we're not in this pathological class of generating functions. And these obstructions only occur, it turns out, when there's a critical point in infinity. And the class, there is a classical definition of critical point infinity. You just sort of take those same equations for critical points and solve them in projective space. And then you do that. And then you get lots of critical points in infinity, uh, most of which are, are spurious. They don't actually mess you up. So you need a slightly narrower definition called disturbance in infinity, which is some sort of limit of a critical point at infinity from actual finite critical points. And I won't really explain it. But you figure out whether that happens. And then you use computer algebra. You do this sort of algorithm. It's really pretty easy computer algebra. And, uh, and you rule out those. And then you go see the touchline. Yeah. So this, computer, this is computer algebra corresponding to the previous picture. The little dot, dot, dot of limits. It's basically saying you need a pointed infinity, which is a limit in, uh, I didn't really say go into this, but the product graph, you take the, the product of the, uh, the manifold V and the log, it's about the log radiant, you take its 
graphical log gradient in projective space across projective e minus one space, and you take the closure of the affine points of that, and you take the ones of those that lie at infinity, and that's what you're looking for. And you can computer algebra that, make sure there aren't any. Okay, so now of course the bad news is you still have to decompose t, and that really is. Here, let's see. We have effective algorithms for this in some cases. So oh, here's the picture. Can you tell what happens? So it turns out that this cycle, you know, this plus this, here's a, as a homology class, hangs up at this point, but not at that point. So because this is a complex manifold, you can tell the orientations of these, and they have to be such that they're both going like this, and they cancel right here, so they touch each other and merge, and taken down here and then they get stuck. So anyway, we have effective algorithms to do this in two dimensions and, and I'm really not going to linger on this slide here which tells you how to do it. And there's three more cases, hyperplane arrangements, uh, if you know the coefficients are non-negative, or if you have symmetric functions of a certain type. But the general case is wide open. So I, I think it's a really nice problem. Find a general algorithm for the smooth trivariate three variables, smooth things. It's easy to characterize the critical points that these solutions to these algebraic equations. So sort of a, a zero-dimensional ideal, you can write down explicitly given the inputs, and then you say this high torus, what are the integer coefficients of the different cycles? Tell me what they are. So you're working over complexes, right? Always over complexes. So two D and two complex. Two complex variables, right. Okay, so then the last part, which will go by very fast, which is good. But I did study a few minutes later with technical details. It'll take five minutes or so. Um, so how do you integrate your singularities? So if you just want one slide on how to do it, here it is. Um, a lot of little steps. You transfer the logarithmic coordinates. Just makes things a little easier. It turns z to the r into e to the r dot x. And then you homogenize, so this, this also turns your function periodic, periodic mod 2 pi i in any of the imaginary directions, but then you homogenize at the origin, so you take the tangent cone at the origin, you replace, so you're actually going to replace this rational function p over q by um, p over the homogeneous, uh, the tangent cone of q, the, the, the leading homogeneous term. And so, um, so that, then it's not periodic anymore. And then you do this thing, you want to integrate over, so the torus, and this becomes flattened out, it becomes uh, just a, a brick of dimension 2 pi in each imaginary direction. But then you can replace the 2 pi by, by infinity, so you end up integrating over a whole imaginary plane, basically. And, uh, you make the critical point go to the origin, so you want to be integrating over the whole imaginary space. And that would be, would be um, and then it looks exactly like a Fourier transform. It doesn't converge anywhere, but it looks like a Fourier transform. And then you, uh, then you do some messy Morse theory type stuff, and you end up sometimes getting an answer. So let me see how far I get in five minus two minutes. Um, step one is easy. Just so the log coordinates, um, if, I, if the critical point started out at 1, 1, 1, it ends up at the origin, which is going to be true in the rest of my pictures. Um, you homogenize, so you do what I say, basically. Do what I said, you, you replace the rational function by 1 with a homogeneous denominator, and you show that the, this doesn't really affect the integrals in the leading order. So that takes a little, you know, a few pages of computation, but it's not really that sophisticated. And in the end, you can you end up computing the inverse Fourier transform. You can think of this Fourier transform. They look the same, but front, forwards, and backwards. Inverse Fourier transform of a uh, a new of a homogeneous, uh, essentially polynomial function in, uh, in in d variables, and then right. It really, so in order to get to there, I guess you have to do this thing where you replace the brick by i times rd. And then you use the theory, which has been around for a long time. Uh, so um, 
this is, you're integrating over this torus, which turns into a set x plus i times rd. So it's like, the, here's real space. And we take a point in real space, and we take all the imaginary things that go with it. We integrate. And as long as this imaginary fiber doesn't hit this blue thing, which is the amoeba of q, so amoeba of q is a set of all log modulus vectors of, of points in q. It usually looks something like this. As long as it doesn't hit that, then it's well, the Lucy integral is well defined. And uh, we take this point x and we bring it up to our critical point of sitting origins right here. We bring it up to the critical point, and there's some nice theory called boundary theory of holomorphic functions that says when that converges and what it converges to, some sort of generalized function sometimes. Um, and we have to mess with degrees a little bit. To get things to converge at infinity, we need, uh, so there's two things, it has to converge at infinity because we made it infinite. But you could do that by integrating by parts a million times as long as you have enough factors of x. And then you need to converge at the origin, so then you need to have uh, another condition you need. But you can make it all work. And, and then you need to do the stuff I didn't explain before, which is, weird deformations that come from the study of hyperbolicity for polynomials, which comes from the 1950s of Lars Garding, studying PDEs, wave-like PDEs, had this theory of hyperbolicity, and then people pulled it out of the woodworks in the last 10, 15 years. Peter Brandon did some amazing combinatorics with hyperbolicity, and then uh, um, Dan Spielman and Marcus uh, used it to uh, prove the Gattis and Singer conjecture. So hyperbolicity is wonderful stuff. And in our case, um, what turns out to be true is that, so this proposition basically says that um, once you've done this homogenization, you have a hyperbolic homogeneous polynomial. You can apply all this theory. And um, so hyperbolicity theory basically tells you that you can make cones of hyperbolicity everywhere, and they vary semi-continuously. So, they can only, let's see, I forget if it's a tangent cone or the normal cone. The tangent cone can only uh, collapse, and the normal cone can only go up. Um, so you get these semi continuous families of cones, and the cones allow you to make vector deformations that stay inside these cones. And they allow you to wrap, so here's your singularity, and here's your imaginary fiber, and you're trying to push it here and then a little beyond, because, you know. Um, you want it to go like to this region, except here. And it looks like in the number of dimensions I drew that you could do that. But really, if you count dimensions, you shouldn't be able to push a plane mostly past a co-dimension two thing once you're in dimension three or more, unless you get lucky or, or actually figure out what's going on. So this hyperbolicity theory solves that problem. It just slide, definitely. Um, and then you end up computing a, 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 an inverse Fourier transform. And then, right, then there's two cases. One, this is a, one that you recognize, like the inverse Fourier transform of a quadratic is another quadratic. Or two, you have to follow some directions that are, it's like you know, playing some video game that nobody handed you the rules to. It's kind of ad hoc. Um, and, Boundary values? Is that what boundaries and homework? Um, I don't know why it's called that. Um, it's just you, you're trying to take Fourier transforms that are not convergent and make them well defined by moving them in sort of the whatever, if this direction is the imaginary direction, move them a little in the real direction or vice versa, right? And, and then take limits and make sure that these limits exist and are well defined. And, Launch that way, and that's what that's what these people do. Armander, guarding people like that. So, the so simplest cases, hyperplane uh, has a dual. It's a it's a ray. Um, the orthant, right? You take one over one plus that one minus one minus one. I see this is the function which is one in the positive orthant, zero you know, coefficient zero outside of the positive orthant, and that's. Um, you know, it's easy to get that from the general theory. 
Um, the, the Aztec diamond that I showed you has this complicated thing, but this is really a linear thing times uh, the inverse quadratic. The inverse quadratic gives you basically a circle, and multiplied by that factor gives you a convolution with uh, a ray that looks like that. So you take the function which sums up the values of 1 inside the circle, 0, or actually it's, like, it's, it's not a constant inside the circle. You get to sum it over vertical slices, and you get the <coughs> Aztec diamond probabilities that I was showing you, which are graphed in this picture to look kind of like this. Probability of yellow is the height of that thing there. And uh, so have any example. harder cases, yeah. Harder cases, I'll say 30 seconds about in this. So this slide tells you what paper we pillaged to get an un understanding of how to do the harder cases. Basically, all right, so taking this Fourier transform, it's a homogeneous function, so that the radial direction you can always integrate out and end up with some other integral in projective space. And then you can always take at least one residue, and you get this thing that's called the Lorray cycle, or the Petrovsky cycle, depending on the interplay between the dimension and the degree of the polynomial. And then you do ad hoc tricks from this paper. And uh, for example, if you have a cubic or a quartic, as are in these pictures, we kind of know how to do it. But it's ad hoc, so we, we, after having solved it in between 2 and now 3 and 4, we still don't know what happens in general. And there's some kind of classification of singularities. Arnold and those people have classified singularities. So there aren't that many different kinds of singularities. So you sort of solve entire degree classes or numbers of variables. And then you, as you go up in degree, there's, there's, you keep getting more types of singularities. You mean classification in low, like low degrees? In low degrees, right. And, and they all like it in, in degree two. They all look like you know, a, a cone, like x1 squared minus the other x. So that's all you get. And then, well, so you get one more, you get the Whitney fleets, but um, which we haven't looked at yet. So there aren't that many. Then the higher the degree, the more different types you have, but it still seems bounded even no matter how many variables you have. So, but this classification, is that is that sort of analogous to Morse theory in that you get, you're, you're trying to use it like a Morse lemma and know what happens? So, is that, like that? so you, you have your, uh, go to the log coordinates and you take the tangent point, you have this, this singularity and you don't know how to do this integral and you don't know where to tuck it behind and which cycle to take and what you get when you do it. But everything is sort of diffeomorphic to either one of these things. So these are the stable singularities. So everything is diffeomorphic to one of those or to some perturbation of one of those. So you might have a much more complicated thing where five of the singularities have coalesced at the origin. But if you do a little perturbation theory, you can kick them out, and then you can figure out how to do it on each piece, and then you have to figure out what happens to the limit as they go together to kind of affect each other a little bit. Then in principle, you can still do it. And we're, we're, trying, we're working that out, so that's, like, there's no slides about that, but that's what you would do. Okay. Uh, and there's a book explaining whatever we knew up to 2013, Mark Wilson and I. Make sure that your library has this book. Don't, don't rush out and buy it. But, you know, <laughs> it should be in the library. Okay. All right. And that's it. All right.
does that take care of this essential similarity to one dimension if you can go to or if you know um, well what that's the thing so I see. Let's say you have a definite univariate function. So first of all, there's a lot that's known just from one variable theory about the behavior of the coefficients of that. The problem is you have to solve a pardon me. I mean some some of these definite functions have yes. essential singularities, right? And um, so the theorem says, as well, we can embed this as some sort of higher part of a higher dimensional rational function. So then, um, phenomenologically, you can sort of see, gee, if I have an essential singularity here, and it blows up in a certain way, maybe I'm going to get an e to the square root of n or something, you know, something like that. And so you can kind of tell what level of complexity you're going to have to deal with in a rational multivariate function. And um, so in principle, if we finish this work with the we finish of automating asymptotic extraction for multivariate dimensional functions, then that will go back and produce those asymptotics. It's not clear whether, so, so there's also in a defining case the a connection problem, right? You, get these asymptotic series near whatever are the sort of characteristic values of the, the defining thing where, where the lead, leading coefficient uh, vanishes. And, um, but then you have to, so you have some linear combination of these things, but they're different elements of the basis may be understood at different points and then analytically continue to the other point, different or just differentially to the other point. So we have this connection problem, which is how does my basis here transfer to a basis here so I can get all the basis elements in one place. And um, so that in general is not computationally understood, how you resolve that. And that might turn into the same thorny issue of once you have a homology basis for your rational d-variable function, how do I resolve the original cycle into an integer combination of these basis elements. And we have the same problem. We have a bunch of candidate series, and the real asymptotic series is some linear, in fact, probably integer combination of these candidate series. How do we tell which one? And, and that probably just mirrors the financial problem from, from differentially finite functions and solutions that would be easy. It seems like there are still lots of difficulties. Right. So let me mention one more thing. So there, there's going to be a math research community devoted to this topic in June of 2020. So applications open tomorrow. They're opening tomorrow. I think it starts in November. Maybe it's already open. I think it's already open. Maybe, maybe they already started. And they close in February or something. And anybody between minus two and plus five years of their PhD date um, is eligible to come to this math research community, which I and my co-author, Mark Wilson, and Steve Meltzer um, and two other people are organizing. And so we hope to splatter all these <laughs> open problems across the screen and then recruit young people from many different fields to solve them because we have our own area of expertise, but you know, mine's probability and combinatorics. It's not really singularity theory or harmonic analysis or Morse theory. And we want to try and solve some of these problems that require knowledge beyond what any of our of the instigators of this are presently an expert in. So to students and postdocs in the room. Keep that in mind. <laughs> we, need, we need your expertise. So stay around here. <laughs>